Welcome to CardioVisual. My name is Tom Blevins with Texas Diabetes and Endocrinology in Austin, Texas. Today, we'll be talking about SGLT2s and the increasing need for endocrinologists and cardiologists to work together in managing our patients with diabetes. Just as you mentioned, there's a lot of new exciting data in heart failure. As you mentioned, Farsiga, which of course is dapagliflozin. Um, and dapagliflozin recently had an update to its indications. Um, the current indications are reducing risk of hospitalization for heart failure in adults with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease or multiple cardiovascular risk factors and to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in adults with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Something we sometimes don't necessarily talk a lot with our patients about is the risk of heart failure in patients with type 2 diabetes. And there's a significantly uh, increased risk of events in patients with diabetes relative to patients without diabetes. Um, in fact, sometimes I'll ask my patients, I'll say, what, what is the most common complication of diabetes? And you, you really start seeing signs of hemodynamic change that we attribute to heart failure pretty early on in, in our patients with diabetes. So any improvement you can achieve um, in, in hemodynamics, in additional factors, um, really looks like gives us um, significant improvement there. So the most recent trial with Farsiga was DAPA-HF. And this was a trial that was designed to evaluate the efficacy and safety of dapagliflozin on top of standard of care in patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction. Interestingly, this study had patients both with diabetes and without diabetes. After a two-week enrollment period, patients were randomized to uh, dapagliflozin at 10 milligrams a day plus standard of care, this was about 2,400 patients, versus placebo plus standard of care, again, about 2,400 patients. Only 42% of these patients had diabetes. And after a median follow-up of about 18.2 months, dapagliflozin demonstrated a significant 26% relative risk reduction for the composite endpoint of worsening of heart failure or cardiovascular death. And in patients with, with or without type 2 diabetes at baseline, when you look at subgroup analyses, both groups benefited. And beyond that, your primary composite outcome and individual components, including hospitalization or an urgent visit for heart failure, hospitalization for heart failure, an urgent heart failure visit, or cardiovascular death, all favored dapagliflozin uh, as well. Another thing that I think will be important to point out here is a similar trial uh, with empagliflozin is now suggesting that this could potentially be a class effect. I think we'll touch on that maybe later as well. Um, and steglatro, which is ertugliflozin, uh, hasn't met these endpoints uh, yet. But, but I think this is an evolving story and, and it'll be interesting to see where sort of the studies and, and sort of the evolution of these indications go. Um, and sort of building on that, I was going to get Bob's input on how cardiologists view um, these recent studies. Uh, probably the easiest way to look at it is take 35 trainees and ask them about the drug. And they know uh, a little. Uh, they don't understand the mechanism. Uh, they're not endocrinologists, so they're not thinking basic science. Uh, but I think the impressive part is that these numbers are indisputable. Whatever drug you want to pick, we're now starting to see a benefit in heart failure. And it doesn't have to be type 2 diabetes. So now you have a cardiovascular drug here. Uh, and you can use it or not, but this one saves lives. And I don't have one as powerful as this. I mean, you can use uh, Sucubitril, but the side effects is higher. This class of drugs is extremely well tolerated. 
Uh, so Cubitril doesn't make you lose weight. You don't lose calories. You don't lower your blood pressure like this one does. Uh, I mean, when you take and give it to non-diabetes folks and they show a benefit, uh, it's impressive. And two, it occurs very quickly. This doesn't take a long time to see a benefit like you saw with these other compounds. So I think the cardiology guys, one, don't understand the mechanism, which means that primary care and endocrine who use it mostly will have to spend some time with them. They were very slow uptakers on statins, took a long time for them to start using statins. Uh, I think we're mostly into uh, put a stent in the vessel and we go after ischemic heart disease because we're comfortable with that. That's what we trained on. Heart failure too is high blood pressure. This drug will lower your blood pressure around four or five points. So it's difficult to not know this drug. To me, this is actually a cardiovascular drug, but was marketed under the auspices of endocrinology with diabetes. But we didn't know that at the time. But so was enalapril. Enalapril was an insulin sensitizer. It came on the market uh, actually to lower your blood pressure. But when you looked at the data, it lowered your actual glucose levels. So I think that um, anything good for endocrine is probably good for the heart. And this just is, shows you spectacular results. Uh, so I think the, certainly the heart fair is the big ticket item for the cardiologist. Cardiovascular events, I don't think so much for, we didn't decrease acute coronary syndrome here in any of our trials, uh, but we did decrease cardiovascular death. I'm not sure the exact mechanism. We've, we can talk about that. Uh, but the kidney is the other big player here. Those three big areas and the kidneys to the cardiologist are pretty important because in the lab, we poison kidneys a lot of times with dye. And diabetes patients are number one on my list to watch for. Mm -hmm.